Architects normally complain about people don't understand us, but we don't really go out and go educate people. We are, as architects or people of the built industry, are in environment, and there's very little other people or clients here. So maybe that's somewhere where we should concentrate on, and not just talking to ourselves, but actually talking to clients more. We, we're a company of, of diversity in a sense, and where we do things of real passion in different fields. We, we deal with commercial projects, and we deal a lot with inner city housing things, and things that uh, Brian talked about earlier. Um, we work a lot for a company called City Property that own a large number of properties in both Johannesburg and Pretoria, CBD areas. And with our passion, I think, and I'm hoping, and it's getting there, we are making little bites into the elephants and showing them what we can do for them. We as the built environment professionals, but also going out there and doing it with passion. And it's about ultimately responding to the brief, responding to the, the site, responding to the uh, environment, and then transforming this. But transforming doesn't necessarily mean cocking it up or messing it up, but is enhancing it and giving it back to what we think is ultimately the right solution. And when you look at it, it should look like it's always been like that. So we do a few things quite aggressively and some things very subtly. Um, there's a quote by Alvaro Cesar talking about architects don't invent anything, they transform reality. And whether you agree with it or not, we have a huge responsibility in that creating or transforming of reality. We need to create space and we need to address the human factor within that. Um, the first project I want to show you is, is a project we did for City Property in Kempton. It was uh, a, the first mall, as such, that was built in South Africa. It was called the Kempton City Mall. It had roughly 40,000 square meters of retail space and um, 177 apartments in the development. It was, you can see it was the first mall. It was, people were still, architects like us were still learning how to do it. We then got a brief and said, well, um, to optimize this, this building for residential use, and it's a typical urban CBD environment in South Africa in a sense of people using it, but it's fallen to disrepair. We then jumped in, and sorry, another contributing factor was this massive mall called Festival Mall built on the other side of the railroad tracks. We uh, jumped in and we, we demolished roughly 35,000 square meters of, of retail space to so kept in essence, the footprint of the 177 apartments and then also a parking space in the, in the south and one in the north, which housed a gym at that stage. This is what we ended up with. We put uh, another layer of apartments underneath the 177 apartments and we built another 210 apartments in this block and it's talk about architectural merit in another space, but the thing that we needed to do and convey to the client and this and also to the user is ultimately the response for us onto the urban streetscape and how to soften it and how to bring people back into it and not just create or not create a space that it will fall back into disrepair. Yes, a lot of it has to do with maintenance. But when you get to a development like this, where we house, where there's residential, 469 residential units in there, varying from, from bachelor to a three-bedroom apartment, it, it stops being a part, 
uh, stops being about the dwelling unit in a sense. It becomes, and it talks to the relationship between the units to each other, but also creating a sustainable community ultimately for these uh, people living in there. And you have families with babies right up to sort of grandparents living in these blocks. For us, what we succeeded in doing is in selling to the client is the, 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 in a very small scale and yet again, that sort of small bite into the elephant is ultimately greening things and creating spaces, uh, and you can, can't see behind there, is creating green open spaces ultimately for it. But also then, in a very small way, and it is, is adding something to the urban scape. And I was brought to have in a family where art is very important, and we um, have been brought up by being almost patrons of the arts. And I, through, um, was convinced the client to spend money on, on, on sculptures on this block. So, what you can see here, and it's, sorry, it's a little bit blurred at the moment, is the old uh, part of the 177 apartments and then the new block there. But you can't see here, yeah, is, is, is very blurred, sorry, is, is, a, is a sculpture of a, a man diving into the pavement. And we used five different forms on this, uh, or five different sculptures that we each repeated twice on this development. And with yet, yet again, little bites into the elephant, creating and nurturing people and creating an awareness of art for people and an awareness to other forms that people in, normally in, in South African inner cities aren't um, confronted by. So you can see there, and there is the one guy jumping into it. We got a lot of resistance with adding these trees in here because people can't see the, the signage and at the end of the day, the client um, agreed to it and they have now on other projects that we're not involved with for them, but uh, other architects as well, are enforcing planting of new trees on the pavements just to bring that sort of, I think, humanity into it and nature into it, bringing it a more sort of sustainable thing. And Brian was talking about New York earlier and it's, I've been privileged enough to be there, to have traveled there and it's, it's, it's an amazing city, but one of the amazing, most amazing streets for me in, in New York is Park Avenue because there's trees lining that street. And it just brings it sort of the humanity to it. And probably because we live in Africa and we're so close to nature. You can see there again. This is just sort of the new main block and the accentuation of it. We also built into these what we call sky courts. So on every second level, we have a bigger space opening up and just creating a space where people can have positive conflict with each other. So people where you can go onto a street, a city park or something like that and you can talk about things to each other. And the idea of that is ultimately is creating a space within this community of people because 469 apartments, the chance of having 2,000 people living there is great. So having another space where you can just step out of your unit because this specific block, a apartment or bachelor unit is 27 square meters. And then a, a, a one bedroom is 37 and a two bedroom is 55 square meters. So it's, they're not enormous flats, but they are what well, we think designed well in the sense of how they live and how they spatially work. You can then look down onto the sort of internal courtyard and we've made an artificial lawn of, for playing of soccer or football. And then just some, you can't really see in this photograph, but um, grass mounds where people can sit and watch the soccer, but also in this area have a nice braai, but also then have a space there where kids can play. You can see the mounds. And there you can see sort of another sculpture there, sort of a man jumping off the diving board. You can see the, the playground, and we played around with the little ideas of how to do it in very subtle ways. We now and a new project really engaging the clients of transforming the, 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 the podium level of the building into great entertainment and playground for kids in, in downtown Johannesburg or CBD of Johannesburg. See another guy. 
And then another, the second one of that, in that series, sort of jumping off the building. But that, that to me is in essence is, is this project where you, we need to educate our kids, but you also need to, to confront them with other forms, not just science and maths and things like that, but art for, for me is important. And yes, it's a very sort of funny or sort of immature way maybe, but it's, it's great for people just to interact with it and start to know and start to engage art without being something that is this huge sort of long talk of what it actually is. This is just the guy diving into the pavement. It's nothing more. There's a lady sort of doing a backstroke in the, in the garden. And there's another guy jumping in. And then a guy doing breaststroke. And that, that is sort of that height. And it's great with numerous times I've been there, kids and people have sat on that guy's head. And that to me is amazing. Next building we did in town is called Dance Place. And it was a late 1960s Stark Forster building in town very modernist, and it housed a gallery called Gallery 101 at one stage, which I don't know if there anybody that remembers it in downtown Joburg, had exhibitions of amazing artists in there. We converted the top floors into residential units, but we also then engaged a local NGO in Johannesburg called uh, Our Shot, uh, it's a program by T where they teach uh, street children photography, and they take it out on Monday afternoons. They do take normal sort of muck and drick cameras down, and they teach them photography and the art of composing things. And we used a bunch of their photographs on the screen, ultimately, of, of scenes of Joburg in a typical nice sort of market scene of apples, selling of apples. Uh, the next one is also a city prop one, and the last one of the inner city projects, but it was an um, old stucky building in town. It's called the second Anstey's building. Um, Brian referred to the Anstey's building. This is the second one, uh, and it is 102 years old, um, 103 years old this year. It is actually interesting. It had a, a steel construction, of it, and not, a, not a concrete construction frame to it, but it was in really disrepair. Uh, and it sits on the corner of Joubert and Kerk Street or Church Street, um, what it was. And we, we, we refurbed the units and we just put a little bit back and well, no major science in here, just, just cleaned it up, made it nice and habitable space now. So we have another 40 units of apartments on the top three floors there. The rest is all retail. But one of the nice things about this this area and the whole urban revival to me in, in these spaces or what people perceive as urban revival is the fact that this client is taking what I think is not the elitist people and taking sort of a lower uh, middle class, a higher lower class of people and, and giving them space in town which is very good quality. Not, not quality that we high-end clients would want but is, is sure that they are secure, everything works, and it works well. But they are now, and I'll show you a slide a little bit later, are uh, starting to really think, and it's where those little bites into the elephant are starting to pay off, of what we can really do to the city. Because of what are the buildings they own, they're now really realizing that what impact they can make on a bigger scale. And it's not by attracting the elite back into town, it's attracting the real people of South Africa. I think us as Europeans in this country should realize that we live in Africa. And it's not about bringing white faces back into the city, it's making the city amazing for the rest of the people in South Africa as well. And, sorry, just to go off point, this, you should do yourself a favor and go walk down Carrick Street or Church Street. It is amazing. People go to all these markets and think, they're amazing with all the fresh produce they sell. Go walk around here. I mean, you get everything from tackies to amazing new, nice, fresh vegetables for sale. And much less of a price that you can get anywhere else. And you also get the tunnies that 
sell and sit there the whole day, and I was amazed by her selling little potions to get rid of, get rid of cockro cockroaches. And they, all, they, all she does is scream, Coco, Cocorot! And it's amazing just seeing people living there. I mean, yes, the city has things, and I've been mugged and, or pickpocketed and stuff, but it's, 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 it's amazing walking around there. Um, the next, next thing is, 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 a, is a few slides of what I call, um, excuse my French, the, the Euro shit work, and things that we get recognition for. And this is a project in Swellendam, and it's set against the, on, on the foot of the Langeberger, and in a place called, has a big sort of opening in the mountain, with, which, which they call God's Window. And the first two slides are basically of what it looked like before we got in there. And it, it was overgrown with wattles and uh, not, not the pretty pictures that people normally see of, 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 of this. And it was a huge amount of aggressive sort of intervention into it to, to let it make, make it well, what I think makes it look like, uh, like it's been there all the time. And it complements the contours and the setting quite well. Um, I mean, this, that's totally different sort of from the first sort of views that you have and what people see. It's a, this is a single residential dwelling consisting out of um, sort of a guest room block, a main bedroom block, and a movie theater. And also underneath there is, a, is garages and it's double story, that building, and then the main entertainment space. And the brief was um, to have the entertainment space sort of open, engaging, but then also probably inherent and unfortunately inherent in some of the briefs that we get nowadays is to make a safe space for people living out on a farm and to have a cave where they can live ultimately in. So that's why these blocks are so enclosed. It's, not, it's just a space almost for sleeping, not necessarily for inhabiting as much. Um, it is also, if you look at this sort of view, it is... I like, in, in sort of the approaches to houses, I like hiding something from, from the user or the visitor is, because you, if, you, if you step back and you look at these sort of slides, I mean, you engage with the mountain continuously when you arrive, but then when you ultimately engage the house, it's about a different scale that you have to approach, and it's an approach to going up the stairs to the house, but not necessarily going directly into the front door, facing a blank wall, and it's, um, we are again privileged enough to, to visit Tadao Andu's um, conference center in near Basel by the Vitra uh, Museum, and it's, the building is, is, is amazing in a sense of the approach to the building. It's not a direct line towards the front door. It is a sequence of, of, of walkways that you take that turn through this amazing cherry tr plantation or tree, tree, trees, and the whole idea is, is to be calm again and to realize that what you are going to be doing in this conference facility and be becoming quiet in a sense. And I think that's important in how you approach buildings. And I, I've been privileged enough to work in amazing settings and, and beautiful natural environments. And sometimes you want to hide that from people as well, from the user. Um, when you go up into that front door, there's also, you have that wall continuing through it. And it's, it's a well, sort of low, it's three meters high ceiling, and then it opens up into ultimately that space that you're getting in there. So it's coming down there and ultimately opening into it. This slide also um, shows just, we, we talk in South Africa a lot about inside-outside living, and um, that sort of thought of design process in my head has evolved along a lot over the last few years, and this is what's, the first, one of the first that we sort of played around with it. And, um, and, and residential, single residential buildings in South Africa, we, we confronted by the covered patio a lot. People want that covered patio. And I think the covered patio is such a waste of time and money sometimes. And people, we as architects normally put them in the wrong place. We put them right in front of the building, in front of the northern facade, and we block out all the natural light coming into the space. So the, the, the evolution, I'll show you a little bit later, but ultimately is the solution at this point was to put the, the covered patio to the side of the house and not block ultimately 
the natural light coming into. And there's also a little bit of a um, connection between the main bedroom and the main entertainment space. You can see there again. And that's sort of underneath it. And very, you talked about your photographer friends and how they do stuff, but it's many caring things. <laughs> um, The idea with this fireplace was also not just to create heat in the space, but also to be a fire hearth, is that right? Five feet hard, the wrong sort of somewhere where you can actually make food and, and, and utilize as not just an ornament or beautiful thing, but actually something you can utilize in the, in the space. Just see it again. Unfortunate little bit of cows on the. <laughs> This is the main bathroom, and this, this floor as such is also, as, as a, this is a timber deck and not just a timber floor, so all the, this is a wet room. All the water can cipher through the deck and collect, be collected underneath with the shower being on that side. There you can see the shower head. Um, living in South Africa, we, we always want to shower outside and have the exterior showers, and sometimes, like all projects, ultimately ha has a budget. And, my solution to that thing is uh, of not having two showers, but is to have a big sliding door normally on a, on a shower, so you can open that. And that to me is, feels like exactly like you're outside, but you utilize the same space for two uses. This is the spare bedroom, bathroom, and they're very similar and instead of, except the, the shower head is a little bit cheaper. You can see the space and the client living there with these Arabian studs. So. Next house is out in Monan Farm. And when we, we started this project, this was the second or third house to be built to Monan Farm. And, and it's an amazing estate for, for what they stand for, and Torsten and them work there as well. Um, is one of the things there is that there is very little that, that, that governs you in in creating or, or, or defining space or, or gives you rule or, or guidelines of how to design it. So it's designing is similar as to designing on a farm and with restrictions about walls and things like that. So ultimately what we did, when we got, you can see what it was at that stage is the sort of open space and not, not really anything defining space except a line of trees which was on the, on the southern side of the property. Um, we ended up by building a, a two sort of main walls in this house, sort of screening from the public side of the house. The main road runs past the site, but also, and then has the entertainment area behind it. And we screened with these walls and, and yet again hiding that sort of what is behind it and what is the real experience of the house and, and making somebody calm going into the rest of the house again. You see how it sort of sits in the landscape. The front door of the house is there. Also, in, in the state, people obviously want dogs, but you, you're not allowed to do any uh, boundary walls, so we created a little bit of a courtyard space. It's cut into the ground uh, where they could keep their uh, dog at that stage, and this house was, was a, a weekend house at that stage. This is then the sort of the next step of, of how to place or how to live the inside outside and our sort of thinking is ultimately having a entertainment, so I'm gonna skip through these, having a, a kitchen space, a dining room and a lounge and then supposedly the patio and it's interesting we, we we went through this whole process of engaging the client and talking about how you live and how you, what you do and how you ultimately move the glass walls away and then you're out on your patio. So there's no real need for a patio. And no, they wanted the patio and we, we convinced them to put, them, put it on the side and not block any light coming into it. We still had the doors that sit in that position that either go, sit there or slide into that cavity. And what you can see on this photograph that's interesting is that there is no patio furniture because their lounge has now become their patio. So they have realized that you don't need all the other things. 
You, can, you don't need the two sets of dining rooms. You don't need the two sets of lounges. You can just have that space. Let's see, sort of looking out onto it. Um, this is at um, Monan Farm, as well as it's called the Other Side Restaurant in Delhi. It was the old pigsty and sort of just old farm buildings, and we converted, and you can see the pigsties, and we converted it into um, the Other Side Restaurant. It was about ultimately engaging and then transforming that into a beautiful landscape space. And the nice thing about working in an amazing settings is that, yes, we, we try and create beautiful buildings, but it's not about the beautiful buildings, it's about the, the lifestyle and how that complements ultimately the surroundings. Created this big, long stoop as such, and then added the mist sprays for some cooling down. See the space. So this is the old pigsty. And that was the old, um, there was an old barn on it with a hole in there for servicing of the tractors and things like that. But now it's an amazing space. Uh, Westcliff Pavilion is a, is a project we finished in April last year. It is a, a brief uh, by a client in in Westcliff to build a cottage or a subsidiary dwelling. And the jo old Joburg uh, town planning scheme allows for subsidiary houses to be built. Depending on the size of the plot, the more you can build. And this specific one, you can actually do two. It's 5,600 square meters of, of land in Westcliff. The only sort of prerequisite to the actual size of the, or to the building is that it shouldn't be bigger than 110 square meters. The brief was to build an open uh, two-bedroom, two-bathroom cottage. Uh, at that stage, it was still going to be used by them uh, to live in, and the main house was then to be converted for uh, the client's daughter and her family. At the moment, they're unfortunately renting it out. Um, we, this is the site beforehand. It was a um, one of the other things, sorry, in Westcliff is that you're not allowed to build on the ridge where the slope is bigger than one and three. So we, we had to go look for a, a space where we can actually fit this 110 square meter building into. And we found this, got to this one portion, which was the old, um, what do you call it? Uh, compost, compost heap space and where the, all the garden refuge used to be taken to. It was overgrown. Um, you can, you'll see this tree a little bit that tree a little bit later as well. This is what we ended up with. So, part of part of the constructions or problems with the site was that it was a na very narrow approach. So we couldn't get any concrete trucks or any normal sort of things in there that you would associate with building. And we started playing around with steel structure to the building and how to to do it. And then instead of using a normal sort of surface bed and building it up. We used just a normal comp column structure, which we can do very localized foundations to it. Uh, there was also a huge amount of stone on the site. So the nice thing about that is that through the foundations and some other loose rock on, on the site is we harvested all the stone for these walls from the site. Um, also, on the one side of the... the the property or the house, it's, it's, it's framed or, or boundary of it is a nice rocky outcrop, which is part of the normal copy clip in Westcliff, which is a granite that is used in that side as well. And what it does is this is the sort of approach to the house. It defines this outdoor space as well that you have there. This is sort of just showing the rest of how the house is really suspended in it. There's very little brickwork or mortar or concrete used in there. Actually, the walls is constructed of EPS or expanded polystyrene, which is then plastered. Uh, the floors are the old normal sort of timber construction, which is well insulated from the bottom, 
The roof is well insulated as a, a clip lock system at a two degree angle on top there with massive box gutters that actually take up that whole sort of overhang space. Uh, a nice feat in this building is ultimately is this stone wall which is suspended. And in there is a massive steel beam or, or truss system that actually carries the weight of that. You can see here uh, we do have an outside shower. Being 110 square meters, there is no real space for open, cluttered space. And every real space is well used. In, in this wall, going into the house, it is used for storage, not only in sort of built-in cupboards, but also for a pantry and uh, linen and all those things. In it. You can see there. What we've done as well is, is for instance, in this bathroom is this whole bathroom door slides open. So yet again, you feel like you're outside. What we've done here is sort of really the, the, the it's really worked well where we've made the entertainment or the living space of the house, the patio of the house. See, we've got three aluminum sliders that slide here that locate on the side and when you open both sides, it's actually just like a big patio that you're sitting on and living in that lives out onto either the copy or side or the vista side where you look down onto Holland Insurance, the zoo, and Joburg Den. And it's amazing. People ask me what, what is their favorite view of this house, and I must say both of them are amazing because either looking into sort of the vista view or into the copy is amazing. And it's, it doesn't feel like you are five minutes away from the city of Johannesburg or the CBD. Interesting fact is the, 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 the person that is renting the space gave the, the estate agent the brief by saying he wants a tree house close to the city. And I don't think you can have a better space than that. Some more. Also, just go back as, as the, all these, there's, all the, all the opening sections on sort of ground level as such is, are doors and people's preconceived about security, idea about security. We made all these top flats openable for ventilation and not necessarily somebody can get into. But this house is, is great in a sense. The orientation is good. The ventilation is amazing and the insulation is also amazing. And people will go on and talking about green architecture and green architecture and what you should really do. And to me, green architecture is only about really fundamental good design. So having the ventilation right, having the orientation right, and having the insulation in the house right, you don't need anything else really than that. The bathroom. The second bathroom is a very small space, and yet again, it's, it's sort of use of the timber deck area. There's a shower head right on top of you, yeah. In space. The whole scullery is ultimately hidden behind those cupboards. And you can see sort of just the sliding mechanism of it. We also, in the, in the practice with having good furniture in it as well, is we try and design all elements, and not just because we control freaks, but we really like designing the kitchens and the cupboards and all the vanities for people as well. So this is the, just the plan of the house. You can see it's 110 square meters, sort of interior, 150 square meters total, but it's just the lounge, dining kitchen, small bathroom and then a, a bedroom and then a bigger bathroom on that side and then the bedroom. This is a house we finished at the end of December last year. It's called Hillside House. It is um, set in its position right there. Um, it is settled on the Annandale Road between Somerset West and Stellenbosch. Over here, you've got Garden Peak wines, you've got Ernie Els wines, and you've got a hill, um, Hidden Valley wines on that side. So the property goes sort of, yeah. Um, the interesting thing about this site is... Um, North is sort of perpendicular to the line of vines there, so to this side. Um, and the site falls in two directions. 
and it, which is quite a challenge if you want to face north. But the end results of it is actually amazing where, I'll show you now, where the house is actually over three levels. And you can sort of see it, the site there, sort of excavations that we had to do. And the house is designed over three levels, but all three levels walk out into ground level at some point. And we refer to lower ground, ground, and then upper ground in the house as well. So there's the house um, at a sort of approach road going into it. Sorry, some s good photographs and sort of almost just at the end of the construction photographs. And yeah, um, so the approach road to the house and, you, and you, the, the concept behind it is to, to drive into the old Plas Vaf of the house where you arrive and it's, it's a very sensory experience as well with gravel in it, with car wheels turning over it the garages, and then yet again, what we, sorry, just, so the garage is behind there. So you can see how the house is split over three levels, but all three levels sort of work out onto ground level. So getting back into it, so you arrive in the arrival court, and there's the front door. Yet again, that idea of, you sit in this amazing area, but you want to, calm people down, have that threshold experience going into the house. So coming into it, front door, um, and then sort of at this point you can either decide to go into the main house or to the spare bedroom which is currently occupied by the owners, older kids, they have varsity so they don't really want them in the house but they want them at the house. So they live and they study at Stellenbosch and they, but they live at home front door, and then on the other so this is the view, as you open the front door, and it's sort of an early photograph, sorry, just before they moved in, is bringing nature back into this courtyard behind, yeah, the building is, is almost built in a U-shape, which creates a nice space and hides or, or screens the, the user from ultimately southeast of wind howling over the kopi, and creates a space where they can bry and have an outside space during those stormy conditions. You can see sort of the back and where the courtyard is. Yet again, the house, this level of the house is almost clad completely in uh, a granite, which is yet again harvested from the site. Just how it's a little bit later now, sort of where this, the fain boss is starting to grow back onto the, the garden and where it is now, sort of romantic notion with the sprayers and sprinkler system on. On the one side of the courtyard is, is the studio space of the house. The husband works from the home. And the other side is, is sort of, on top floor is residential, uh, two, two bedrooms which actually can turn into three bedrooms, but also then a sunroom in this space where, you, where if I turn to the right, yeah, I can see the back of Table Mountain ultimately. See sort of the arrival court. And then looking into the distance, you have Stellenbosch on that side. So this is the link for, for daily use for the client to walk from his bedroom to his studio. And then from the user, can either come to the front door and then go into the entertainment level. Or if they has a client to come and see him at home, can just go up the stairs to that space. The main living room space, this is a 14 and a half meter door that slides open and then ultimately lives out onto the deck and this yet again then becomes your patio and then you there you go up onto the main suites on top the kitchen there's the main sort of staircase with this nice skylight on top and gives this nice sort of shadows and I think Shadows is an amazing next layer to add to a building that, that gives that texture to the building. And we try and use texture a lot in, a, in our houses because I feel that when you use texture, you show off texture. So by having something rough against something smooth, you accentuate the both of the textures to it. Main bedroom, yet again, we try and design everything, so designed all the beds and things. And that's sort of the views. Sorry, those slides are the wrong way around. 
the main bedroom then lives out into the garden space on this side, and the main bathroom was over there. This is on the deck, and yet again, we, there was a need for a sort of a covered area, but it's to the side of the building, not, not in front of the, the doors or the lounge. Let's see it there. And unfortunately, sometimes you do catch Roy cut in your fence that you put in, but luckily he was unscathed. Uh, some of the things that we are busy with at the moment is in town, we are converting this building, it's an old 23-story building, into residential and more retail space. But, and this is the um, podium level that we are now converting into big entertainment space for kids and for the residents in there. And that's the whole sort of eating of the elephant of convincing clients that to have a, a sustainable community in the apartment block is very important. We all I'll show you some other photos now. Oh, this one is, is interesting. This is CBD of Johannesburg. Sorry, it's a little bit blurred. All these, these buildings marked in here, 67 of them is which our city property owns. And the blue represents retail and residential, and the red uh, represents retail and commercial or office use. And we are now in a process of working with the client and, and making sure that to engage people on street level more and making it a better space on, on, in the city. Because they realize that that building there, and that's called Ricky's Place, um, is one of their best buildings uh, or the, the highest rentals that they can get. And through discussions, it's, it's realized that the reason for that is because this is where sort of the banking district is and where a lot of money has been spent in, on, on, on cleaning the paving, planting trees and all of that. So it's that environmental sort of and, and urbanism that is adding to the value of their ultimate properties. And we're now engaging that and where something like an urban think tank can work. A project that we're working on is worked on, it's unfortunately not going ahead, is a school for the arts. This is out in Paris, and a free state is a, a whole sort of a small hotel. Um, a residential project in Park View, it's different options to it and creating a small community within the settlement, and unfortunately people want sort of gated, sets, gated settlements. We're not a fan of them, but we try and design around them. Uh, some apartments that we've done, and sort of kitchens and joinery that we've designed in them. Um, also, the reason for this slide is, is with hut furniture, we design light um, as well and various other furniture. And just to showcase some of the work that we do there, this is called the insert table, and it's a coffee table, and sort of epitomizes our sort of design concept of using very natural products with very contemporary products. And it's a steel foot that's at this stage, in this instance, is clad with copper that carries and suspends the, the tree in, in sort of 50 mils off the ground. It's extremely heavy, though. This is a couch that we do. And this is uh, a table called the Josie Table. Part of our love, obviously, for the city is, or Johannesburg, is translated into table. And it's got the CBD of Johannesburg laser cut into the top. And then it comes with sort of three standard legs and then a choice of either sort of the, the Brixton. Uh, uh, and I'll show you some of There's more graphics. So you get the Brixton, the Hillbrow, or the Ponty as one of the other legs to it. Uh, and we've just made for Design and Alba this year, we've made the Cape Town table, which we're calling your master tafel. And it's got the Cape Town CVD yet again, sort of laser cut into it. And we've used the three buildings in Fedouk uh, on the side of the Dyser Park Towers as the legs there. Um, my son's first birthday gift. Uh, a chair we make called the two chair, and it's, we collaborate with an um, embroidery company out in Letitele area where they use Sangan women to embroid uh, this, the fabric on it. So it's all going back to sort of the craftsmanship and tactileness of, of, and humanity of things. 
we also make it a bench of it, and this is the first one we made and called the two bench. Some of our lights we make. And we use, predominantly in the lights, we use jacaranda timber, which is obviously an alien timber in South Africa. And we get a lot of our uh, wood and timber we get from city parks and other tree fellas where they cut down trees. Just a cluster of lights. And what's amazing about them is the sort of natural thing where they, they dry out. So it's not a, a piece of timber like this you can't kill and dry. So it's all air dried and sort of normally sort of six, to, six months to a year before we start turning them. Just another piece of timber and some we do vessels and things like that as well. Been lucky enough to be sort of chosen with House and Leisure this year to, as part of the sort of iconic design elements of the design in Daba and some of our vessels that we make. Uh, then last piece is um, we were invited last year by the Southern Guild to do a piece for them at the end of the year at the exhibition and we did a piece called The Fallen Conversation and the con concept behind it is, is ultimately is a tree that has fallen down. It's actually four and a half meters long. And the, the concept behind it is the tree that creates space for people to interact and to converse and to exchange wisdom. That old idea of sitting next to the river underneath a tree and discussing things and, and, and transferring knowledge from the elders to the younger people in the tribe or just anybody. Uh, and it, it was inspired by the idea that we are ultimately human because of other humans or then ultimately as well Ubuntu which is a very powerful idea and a concept. And the idea with this is we've created three seats on this tree, and on this, when you sort of, sort of sit over it and you face other people, with this one you're facing one direction, and that tree, seat there you face the other direction. And if you, the reason for that is if you go into any airport, you get all these rows of chairs that sit, and wherever you go, you get... A person sitting and then an open chair, and a person sitting in an open chair. So people are scared of engaging other people and, and talking to each other and, and bringing back that sort of humanity. They'd rather sit on their iPhone, iPad, and I'm guilty as well, and, and look at Twitter or, and not, not engaging other people. And ultimately, with this sort of orientation, you're actually in a better opportunity to face somebody and look them in the eye while you're talking. And yet again, we used uh, Karos's fabric on, the, on it. This is the other side. And then this piece uh, this is we made out of steel. And we took two quotes, one by Nelson Mandela and one by Desmond Tutu, that talk about Ubuntu. And we laser cut it into the, into the uh, bench in um, Morse code as well. So and that's what ultimately that quote stands for. And when we, when I started off the first sort of slide, I said that architects don't invent anything, they change reality. But I think through different means and people have got to engage humanity and lifestyle of people. And you've got to, we as architects have got a huge responsibility that, to that. And whatever how many bites you fight, fight, take out of the elephant, you've got to convey that to your client and educate your client, but also educate people around you more of the importance of good design and also the, the, the relevance and the impact good, good design can ultimately have on space and environment. So ultimately, architects should address humanity and lifestyle. Thank you. <laughs>